This morning, we're in the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 12 through 16. You'll find it in your bullet. Here, we're being given some direction this morning with regard to how we carry ourselves and what our relationship with God will be as we move closer to him uh, in his grace and in his mercy. So let us read from Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 16, and it reads as follows. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a high, great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of God with grace and boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. For you younger people, you may not know who I'm talking about, but Gordon Lightfoot had a song. It was entitled, If You Could Read My Mind, Love, What a Tale My Thoughts Could Tell. And if you could read my mind, boy, do I have some stories that you would like to know, Jamie, I bet, but you probably ain't going to get them. One of the things that I found this week is I have been having one of those weeks. Nothing's gone right. Everything's been kind of a conflict. There's been mis misunderstandings, false accusations, confrontation, mistrust, and yet here I am. Another day in which I get to be part of God's kingdom. And I get to live out my plan. And one of the things that I think we fail to understand is we fail to understand the lenses with which we look at one another and we talk with one another. I am about 10% colorblind. Always have been. When I was in the military to get the choice assignments and so that I could get jump status, I had to memorize the color chart book. The only problem was one time I had a nurse that was holding it upside down, and one of the numbers toward the end is 96, and I said 69 because she had it the wrong way. And she goes, oh, it's my mistake. And I said, oh, yeah, so now it's 96, and I had already blurted that out. So I had to memorize the, the color chart. Thank goodness they had Army used the same one for the whole time. But I do know this much. This is red and this is green. I'm only about 10% colorblind. So I can tell these colors. These colors are, are very clear to me. Now, shades of green mess with me. Shades of orange really mess with me. That's kind of orange is peach, I think, your shirt color um, guy, maybe kind of sorta. But those shades get kind of funky for me. But I know this is red. I know this is green. I know, uh, Shonda, that's kind of a, a, a hunterish, greenish kind of green. So I, I can see those things. So I know that. But it's the shades of green and it's the shades of orange. It's the shades of red that cause me issues. More importantly, what if you're colorblind altogether? Then this ain't red at all. It's gray or black or something other than red. And many times what we find ourselves is we find ourselves telling somebody this is red, and then we tell somebody this is green, and they say, no, it's not. It's gray. 
And then we want to fuss and cuss and get sideways with them because they can't see things our way. Well, they're trying. They just can't. Doesn't mean they don't want to. It means they can't see things our way because they're not even capable of doing so. So red becomes something else to them and green becomes something else to them as well. The problem then is, is that when you and I see green or you and I see red and they don't see that at all, that's where the conflict happens. And so we have to sometimes stop and look at what our intentions are, read one another's heart, listen very intently about what and how we're saying what we're saying and doing so that there's a clearer picture, so that we're not talking past one another. God has been present, and he'll continue to be present in my life because I approach the throne of God boldly, just as it is written in this piece of Scripture. And if I remind myself that I am to be in concert with God's word and God's will, and as I approach the throne and I approach it boldly, I approach it understanding that not everybody sees this as red and not everybody sees this as green. But it doesn't mean that they're wrong. It means that they don't have the capacity to do so by God's design, not anybody else's. No one signs up for colorblindness. So if I continue to argue with someone that that's red, we forget that it's a cup of water that they were thirsty and seeking for. They're searching for water, and I tell them it's right there, the red cup, but there's five cups. And so then they go over and say, this one? And you're like, sure, that one. And then I go over to Sean and said, I, I just told them the red cup. Really? Are they that dense? Are they thick? And sometimes Sean might look at me and go, they must be. It's red. There's a blue one and an orange one and a green one and a purple one. I don't know why they can't see the red one. And the next thing you know, we have forgotten that what they were was thirsty. And they can't see the difference. They just know they need water. We all need God. And sometimes we just forget that when we serve the Lord, we serve it in a capacity that sometimes folks can't see it or they don't understand it because they don't have the capacity to see it the way we're offering it. I want you to look at me through the word of God and I want you to allow me an opportunity to show you and share with you my heart. When when we start looking at one another and talking with one another and all we do is listen to the words and look at the works without looking at the mission, we sometimes get misunderstood or say that we were ill-intentioned when in fact that wasn't our intention at all. But that's the way it was perceived. But seeking one's heart is tough when you marry it against God's ability in the name of Jesus Christ to read our hearts. It says here that uh, the word of God is living and active. So the word of God's got to be alive and active in our life. But also we have to understand that the way it's described here in Hebrews, it can conquer and do all things. It can separate bone from marrow. It can pierce the heart, but it also can read the intentions and thoughts of our heart. And really, that's where we need to focus our time and our attention. Where is our heart in serving the Lord? Where is our heart with regard to that relationship? If you could read my mind, love, what a tale my thoughts would tell. I wonder if you listen to the Gordon Lightfoot song, you, you find out he's just really in love with the girl. But what if we could read one another's thoughts? What if you could read one another's heart? What if in the midst of 
good intentions, we could read someone's heart and say, oh, they have my best interest in mind. They just don't know how to go about it. Or they really do love the Lord. Or they really do love that person. They just don't really know how to show it. They, they can't see that this is red for whatever reason. And, and that should be okay. Let's, let's give them some space to reveal their heart to us. But that's also a two-edged street. It's a two-way street. Just like the sword, the word of God is double-bladed. So is that relationship that we have with one another. And that we have with God. God's revealed his thoughts and his intentions. The word of God has been plain, uh, clearly and plainly put in the Bible. But how often do we reveal our true selves to the Lord? And if we can't do that without embarrassment or being concerned about, how do we do that with one another? It's written in Hebrews that we will be laid bare and naked before God and before the word of God. There's nowhere for us to hide. But we often hide ourselves from God anyway, or at least we think we are. And so that's why it becomes difficult sometimes for us not only to confess our sins, and we talked about that in some detail in past uh, sermons, but how do we reveal ourselves in a true and meaningful way to one another in such a way that you don't worry about my actions as much as letting me give you my heart, letting me reveal to you my heart, let me tell you what I'm thinking or trying to do so that maybe, just maybe, you can help me accomplish what God has planned for me and planned for you and planned for us all along. But if we get too caught up in what's red and what's green, we miss the boat with regard to what the true gift is. So, again, I use the example of someone who is thirsty for water. How about if somebody's thirsty for the word? How about if they're thirsty for God? They're thirsty and we're trying to show them Jesus. But every time we talk about Jesus, instead of about talking about here is the living water that is Christ, we argue about what color the cup is. So how can they come to Christ if we offer Christ in a way that they can't even see or comprehend or understand? So then all they know is, is that we're either angry or frustrated with them that they can't receive Christ and we haven't offered it to them in a way they can handle it. That's on us. That's not on them. And then the word of God starts to sound like a punishment because we all know that person. There's none of those people in here right now. But we all know that person that will whip out scripture and start beating people with it. We, we want them to receive Christ, but we start with Leviticus. We want them to see God's face, but we start with reminding them how much they are aligned with the devil. We want them to come to worship, yet we remind them all the time when they don't come. Hey, come visit our church because we're friendly. And then, hey, you can come to church. What's wrong with you? Probably not our best way to approach them. So where am I going with this? There's three things I want you to take from this. Number one, can anything provide wounds better than a two-edged sword? We talked about scars at the beginning of our worship time together this morning. And sometimes even the word of God leaves a scar. And that's its intention all along. How do I know that you've been through battle, but I don't see the scars? How do I really know that you've been beat around and, and you are truly sympathizing with me as opposed to empathizing with me because you have stood exactly where I'm standing. How do you know that the trial that I am going through is the one that you've gone through? It's by those scars. It's by the piercing of our heart 
by that double-edged sword that's the word of God. Christ was sent to us and he was tested just like we are. The devil tested him face to face on many occasions. Yet Jesus resisted. But he's been where we are. He's been tested. So when we look at him and say, Christ, where are you? Do you know where I'm coming from? He can say, I absolutely do. But we couldn't and wouldn't trust him if it wasn't for his scars. So think about that sometime. Your best ministry is your biggest failures. If you really want someone to believe that you are a believer, show them your scars. But that means what? You have to reveal to them your heart, which means you have to reveal to them some of these stories that, if you could just only read my mind, if you could only just read my heart, the lesson you need is right there. The second thing that I want you to take away from this today is, is I want you to approach the throne of God boldly. What does that really mean? It means that as you get older and more mature in your faith, that your faith is such that you know you're strolling up to the gates of heaven because you already know where you're going. You already know what's been promised to you. You already know what's in store for you. You don't have to worry about an eternity separated from God because you've already been promised through the spilled blood of Jesus Christ where you're going and what's going to happen. So walk to the throne boldly knowing that you, as a person of faith, your heart's been read, your actions and your words have been interpreted, and God has welcomed you despite your shortcomings. And the last thing I want you to remember is, is that I want you to remember that we all are a little bit colorblind. Statistically speaking, none of us cones. This, I'm in your realm, Shonda, you can talk to this better than I. We all have a little bit of colorblindness. There is no such thing as perfect color vision just because of the way our eyes are are, are dealt with and just because of the ambient lighting, et cetera, et cetera. I know I'm about 10% colorblind. I know some people that are fully colorblind. So Margaret laughs at me sometimes when I try to match clothes. So I have to make sure I'm good with red, whites, and blues. I'm good with black. I'm good with gray. I'm good with purple. Purple I can see really good. But I have to stay away from tints of green and tints of orange. So I don't buy anything that's in those color realms because I may put them with something that really doesn't look right. She's gotten better over the years, but she was pretty tough on me when I was younger. Well, I don't understand why you can't. You don't know nothing about matching clothes. Till I had to reveal to her and remind her, I'm a little bit colorblind. And in those color areas in which you keep fussing to me about, if you put two of them together, I can't see them. They're all the same color to me. There may be 20 hues, but I see one. My point is this. We all have a little bit of a deficiency when it comes to looking at this. Some of us have a greater deficiency than others. Just remember that if it's your intention to give water to the person who is thirsty, worry less about the container and worry more about the water. If what we're trying to serve them is Jesus, the living water, the living Christ, the living and active word of God that walked on this planet, if that's what we're serving, don't worry about the color. Just worry about getting it there. In fact, don't even worry about the cup. If you got to take them to water like this, if they're thirsty, they won't care. And brothers and sisters, we live right now in a world that is dying of thirst. They need to hear the word of God, and they need to see the word of God living in you, which means you're going to have to reveal your heart. You're going to have to reveal some of the tales 
your thoughts could tell. This week, it's my simple prayer that you spend some time looking at yourself through the mirror in the lens of colorblindness. How is our ministries such that we can get past the color of the vessel and focus more on what is in it? How can we reveal ourselves so that the Word of God is living and active and it's just not in a book? It's tougher than one might think. I'll leave you with this thought. What if, what if you can read the thoughts and hearts of everyone for just one hour? How many of our hearts, as you would read them, would comfort you and encourage you versus discourage you and run you away? It's a double-edged sword. You might think that that'd be a great gift to have until maybe, just maybe, it's a little bit hurtful. And then understand what would your heart be read as. We all have a lot of work to do, but we also have the Word of God. Make sure it's living and it's active in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen.